Now that we are well into fall and winter is quickly approaching, the days are getting shorter and running in daylight is becoming harder. Wazelle's premium reflective collection is designed with runner safety in mind. Both highly visible in the dark but subtle in the daytime, thanks to the tonal reflective print that only shines bright when reflecting the light. From tight shorts, jackets, and tanks to accessories like hats and gloves, with Wazelle's reflective collection, you can stay safe and stay seen. It is dark here in Cleveland where I've been running, so I just love Wazelle's reflective collection. I'm a big fan of the firecracker tights. The bird pattern is so cute, and they look all over sparkly at night. To check out the firecracker tights and the rest of the reflective collection, go to wazelle.com slash collection slash reflective, or even easier, click the banner link at the top of the Hear Her Sports website at hearhersports.com. Welcome to Hear Her Sports, a podcast for active, adventurous women who love hearing inspiring stories from other active and adventurous women. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or women in sport through a conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. Joining me today is award-winning journalist Christine Yu. Her new book, which just launched this week, is Up to Speed, The Groundbreaking Science of Women Athletes. I was lucky enough to spend some time with her discussing the book, her writing, being sporty, and many things depressing and hopeful about women in sports. Christine's writing has appeared in Outside, The Washington Post, Runner's World, and other publications. She focuses on the intersection of sports science and women athletes. She has long found joy and power in being an athlete in a wide range of sports, including running, surfing, and skiing. We definitely get into it. Thanks to her for being willing to discuss genitals and breasts. Can't wait for you to hear it all. So let's get to it. First of all, welcome, Christine. This is super exciting to have you here. And I also have to admit that your book, Up to Speed, brought up a lot of stuff for me. And, you know, there are many aspects that you write about that are difficult and frustrating. I mean, like, what was it like for you? (laughs) You know, it took me a week to read, but you were with the material, embedded in the material for years. Yeah, it was, um, it was enraging (laughs) in (laughs) part. I mean, to be completely honest, because- Well, I'm glad to hear that actually. Well, so I've been reporting on kind of this intersection of women athletes and sports science and sports performance for a while. And, you know, I was like, oh, I, you know, I kind of get the gist of what's going on. Like, I have an idea of, of, you know, why some of these biases exist, but really kind of digging deeper into both the history of sports and the history of just the sports science field and how things developed and really just, you know, confronting a lot of the misogyny, right? And a lot of just the bias around like women's bodies and what we could and could not do and how those biases have persisted over the years. And I think that's probably the most enraging part, right? Is that it's 2023. A lot of this stuff is still around. You know, the fact that women couldn't participate in the ski jump at the Olympics until 2014 is like astonishing to me because they thought that our, you know, the athlete's uterus would burst or something upon landing. So it's like, how how have we gotten this far? <laughs> but we haven't gotten this far. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you brought up all the history stuff, you know, like, you know, the absurdity of some of the things or how some of the things started and have, you know, like, we're still retaining that. I mean, like that whole bit about how women can't really breathe very well. And <laughs> it's really because of the corsets. Well, of course, you know, and we're still dealing with that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it kind of, for me, really emphasized the fact that once these narratives start, that it just becomes the path that you follow, right? right? Or it just reinforces itself. So you don't even think to question, in a way, what else might be contributing to this, right? So yeah, the thing with the shallow breathing, it's like, oh, women women breathe shallower. Well, maybe it's because we've been like, you know, binding <laughs> our rib cages for so long that like, you know, the, the women, you know, in the 1800s or whatever, that's why they can't breathe well, because you've literally changed their anatomy with these constrictive garments. Yeah, it, it was, it's fascinating to me. And that was a piece that 
I mean, I wasn't entirely sure I was going to include in the book itself, like going through this whole history about how women have been excluded from sports and kind of these these crazy myths that have persisted and have been used to exclude women from the sporting world for so long. But I really feel like it just, you know, it was an important piece of that context to understand what um, environment we're all working within. Well, I, I'm sure that we'll get into the systematic issues. But I mean, for me, that's what it showed is just you know, to get over this, it's going to take this, um, like, big flip in the mind. I don't really, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. And I don't, (laughs) frankly, I don't know either, right? Because it's this weird dichotomy. Because on the one hand, on the sports side, we're saying, women can't do all these things because of, you know, your uterus and your ovaries and your breasts and your hormones, like that somehow automatically disqualifies you from being an athlete or being able to be active. But then on the other side, um, on the science side, scientists are saying, well, women and men are like basically the same, just minus the reproductive system, right? Like we just, so we don't need to study women or think about women. And so it's kind of, it almost feels like a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situation. Totally. Where yeah. like you're, you're stuck. Like, what do you, <laughs> what do you even do, right? You kind of, how do you even move forward um, when you have both sides kind of against you? Well, you know, let's get into some of the actual content of what you wrote about <laughs> with a bang by talking about Alison Tetrick and Could you go over what she told you about her saddle and everything that happened? Yeah, this probably was one of the more infuriating stories I think I listened to. So Alison Tetrick, she kind of started off as, you know, just an amateur athlete, but she proved to be pretty good at cycling. And then she kind of moved up really quickly from, you know, just kind of age group or amateur ranks into the pro circuit. And as she was riding, you know, racing in Europe and all of this, it got to the point where, um, you know, after races, all the girls would go back into the bus, like basically put their legs up on <laughs> on the back of the seats and like stuff ice down their, their shorts because their, um, their vulvas were essentially so inflamed and so irritated from the bike saddles. But they just kind of took it as part of sport part of the suffering, part of, you know, if you want to race at this level, if you want to ride as much as we do, this is what you kind of have to put up with. But it got so bad that, you know, it eventually affected her form. So she'd kind of like sit off to the side so she could kind of avoid some of the tender areas. And, you know, when, when you do that on a bike, it can lead to biomechanical issues that could then lead to injury, which eventually is what happened, right? But what was infuriating for her was that, you know, nobody really talked, like I said, nobody really talked about it, that they just kind of accepted that this happened. Um, And for her, eventually, it got to the point where she had to go get a labiaplasty, which is basically, you know, a plastic surgery um, procedure where they trim the labia, because it's, there's so much uh, scar tissue, and it's like, grown, you know, been so inflamed that they need to like basically trim it down and like remove some of it so that she could basically be comfortable. But she then found out that as she started talking about this, that other women in the Peloton were like, oh yeah, so-and-so had that, that, you know, a couple of years ago, or, you know, this person, go see this doctor or whatever. But that it was just, again, kind of this accepted thing that happened in the sport. And, you know, it made her infuriated because it's like, why why are we going to get like plastic surgery procedures done on our bodies? Like that doesn't seem right. And so, you know, long story short, Specialized kind of caught wind of this and asked her to come in and speak to the, <laughs> speak to them and be like, well, tell us what's going on. Because again, the brands weren't aware of this because no one was bringing it up to them, right? The coaches may or may not have known about it, but again, it's not something that they're open or willing to talk about, right? Someone's, you know, genital region. But so she went into Specialized and talked about it. And then Specialized went and fully invested in designing a new saddle that was designed for women. Because the problem was, was that the women had basically 
kind of a rejiggered version of the men's saddle, right? So the men's saddle went through this whole process of being redesigned because, you know, again, at some point, the cyclists were, you know, getting erectile dysfunction and all these other problems in their genital region because of the way the blood flow was restricted on the saddle, blah, 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 right? So they had des- saddles designed for them that essentially had a cutout in the middle that provided relief, right? That wasn't creating all these pressure points. And so for women, they basically took that same design and kind of made it a little wider for our wider pelvises, you know, made the cutout a, a little bit bigger, But that doesn't work for women because, again, our genital region is different from men's and it responds differently. So what would end up happening in these women was as they rode and the longer they rode, the genital region, like the the tissues around the vulva and the labia would eventually kind of fall through (laughs) that cutout, if you will, and then become like engorged and inflamed. And essentially that cutout, what someone described to me is it eventually, it like essentially became like a vice, (laughs) right? And so when they would get off of the saddle, like at a break, you know, at the end of so much mileage, whatever, but then try to get back on, it wouldn't, you know, the, their general region wouldn't quite fit in their saddle the same way. And so it creates all these problems. So anyhow, Specialized went in and like, redesigned the saddle from the ground up really so that it could accommodate a woman's physiology and anatomy in a way that wasn't even considered in the past, right? And yeah, it's it's infuriating that so many women have gone through this, that, you know, it, they've experienced this pain and discomfort and just accepted it as part and parcel of participating in the sport. Well, so I wanted to bring this up <laughs> because she had all of the same symptoms that I do, or I have all the same symptoms that she does, from the twisting to the engorged vulva. And as I was reading this, was the first time that I knew anybody else had gone through that. Mm. And this is exactly what the problem is. It's like, just as you said, nobody is talking about it. It's like, you don't talk about that. It's shameful, or, you know, like, I have to make do, or, you know, I don't want to be a bother, or I'm lucky to have this opportunity. I mean, like, this... This example to me, in, in in this way anyway, sort of, you know, like wraps up a lot of the problems that we're dealing with. Absolutely. Because, you know, there is so much shame and stigma in talking about, you know, women's body parts, right? Because I think it, because for so long, like we, we were talking about in the beginning, for so long, that has been the reason why women have been kept out of sport. And so... Um, Elizabeth, I don't know how old you are, but I know like growing up, it was very much like you got to downplay that piece, right? Like, you know, I can do every, I'm as tough as the boys. I can do anything like the boys do because you don't want to bring up those pieces of difference in order to mark yourself as different, right? Because if you marked yourself as different, then you were at risk of getting kicked out of this, the kicked off the field, you know, out of the pool or whatever it was and not being able to do the thing that you love. And then, you know, not to mention the fact, right, that these regions are all associated with sex, right? And and that's inappropriate. And we don't talk about that out loud and in public. Mm -hmm. Um, But it can cause these very real problems. And it can make women and girls feel very alone when you are going through issues like this. Right. And, you know, it's interesting because the second reason I wanted to bring this up is because you know, I still suffer decades later. I am yeah. I'm in my 50s, so I'm I understand what you were saying before. Is so decades later, I'm still dealing with a twisted pelvis and having to sort of figure out how to like untwist it after all these years. So this is another thing that I thought about a lot reading your book is that you know, in some ways, oh, it's just a saddle, you know, like yeah. put up with it. But uh, you know, these are really significant consequences to all these issues that have long-term impact significant impact that are about sport, that are about health, that are about career. It's not just a saddle. Yeah. And I feel like there's so many things that are pitched as quote unquote women's issues or women's things that are kind of written off in that way. Right. And that, oh, it's, you know, it's just, it's just a, you know, just hiking pants or it's just, um, like you said, just a saddle or whatnot it really diminishes these issues that are a very real part of 
women and girls lived experience in sport. And we're doing such a disservice to people because we don't pay attention to those things, because we write it off as, you know, oh, just, you know, some silly, you know, women's thing. Right, right. And it's also interesting, you know, like I read that part of the book to my husband and he asked me like, why this happened to you? Why didn't you go search for another saddle? And I was like, (laughs) I tried to think of why I didn't. And I think it's mostly because I knew that all the saddles were essentially the same. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And for um, the part that I forgot to mention with Allison, too, is because she rose up through the ranks so quickly, she didn't really have all of that experience of kind of like testing out different things, too. And then, right, and then once you're on a team and you're sponsored, you're just using that, you know, your sponsor's thing. Right. You don't really have a choice to do that. And then it was all kind of men around her who were either fitting her bike or, you know, working with the team or whatnot. Um who were just telling her essentially like it, it's supposed to hurt. It's not supposed to be comfortable, <laughs> you know, like again, that it's just a given. Um, my husband too, when he read this section, he was like outraged. He kept like coming out of the room and being like, what, <laughs> like, <laughs> what is going on? He's like, how is this even possible? Yeah. Um, yes. This is the part of the book. He continues to like try to, you know, he's like, can you believe this? Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Yes, we can, actually. Yeah. Okay, so the third reason I wanted to talk about this, start out with the Allison Tetrick saddle, is because it leads into this bigger discussion that I love talking about, which is clothes. Mm -hmm. And I love talking about it because, like I said, you know, it's not just a saddle. It's not just the pants, blah, blah, blah. It's so many other implications. It's something that we talk about a lot on the podcast. And I was really surprised by the soccer cleats. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, the first prototypes of women's soccer cleats happened in 2020. Like, how is this possible? Yeah, this was another thing that I was like, this has got to be wrong. <laughs> like, this can't, <laughs> this can't be right. Because, yeah, for like, there has not been a woman's specific soccer cleat until, you know, just a couple of years ago that women have primarily worn men's shoes or brands will often sell, you know, women's shoes, but it's really like a unisex cleat. Right. Yeah. And if it's unisex cleat, usually that means it's really based on the uh, geometry of a men's foot versus a woman's foot, but we'll just call it unisex. <laughs> so that's what, even at the pro level, that's what these players have been using and have relied upon. Um, other ones who have happen to have smaller feet have to wear kids boots. Right. And there may not be the best material or the, you know, the best performance shoe that they need to be performing at this elite level. And those shoes matter. And especially in a sport like soccer, um, because not only is the anatomy of a woman's foot shaped differently, but there can be differences in how we load our feet, right? When we run, when especially when you're doing something like planting and kicking. So it matters potentially where those cleats are actually placed on the bottom of the shoe. Is it placed in a spot where you're adding a lot more pressure up through, you know, the leg than you need to be? Are there other places where you can put it? So athletes have been like cutting, duct taping, you know, shaving down, you know, the cleats on the bottom just to make it fit for them. But again, you're in this position where like you feel like you need to be grateful Right? right. You don't want to rock the boat. You're getting free shoes and free stuff. Like, I'm not going to complain about this. I'm not going to tell them what's wrong with their stuff. Yeah. And it, again, we're just, could we potentially be increasing our risk of injury because of the shoes? You know, if you have more comfortable shoes that fit you better, that don't cause pain, could that lead to less injury because you're not fatigued? You're not, you know, thinking about, oh, if I just run maybe a little bit this way, I won't get a blister there. You know, it's there's all these implications. What I don't understand about the soccer is that, you know, like there's no way you can argue that <laughs> there aren't enough female soccer players out there. And, you know, you also talked about Title IX, the clothing company. And in some ways, you know, you would think that that would have basically shown that there was a market and it didn't seem like anything happened from that. I mean, Title IX has been incredibly successful, but it wasn't like anybody followed suit. Yeah. So I, what I don't understand is like why the money is not following these examples. Yeah, I could, that's, 
great question. And I wish I had the answer to it because, yeah, for sure, just looking at soccer as one example, there, you know, there is no way, like you said, that there's not a market here or that a company could not make money <laughs> going into this, right? And I, I don't know. I feel like it's, it is partially this continued notion that, you know, women aren't serious athletes and we don't take our women's sports and our women athletes seriously. Because if we did, we would be investing in gear and clothing and footwear and all of these things that would, again, like potentially reduce injury risk, keep them safe, help them to perform better because that's your investment, right? Those are, that's your, I'm trying to think of a better word than commodity, but like those are, those are your puzzle pieces that you're working with. That's what you depend on. You would want to make sure that they're getting the best, but I think it just, you know, in my kind of cynical brain, right? Like it kind of continues to show this, this thing that we pay lip service to equity in sports and all of this stuff. But when it comes down to it, making that actual investment, the money isn't there. Right. If I'm being kind, I sometimes can think like, oh, it's just a lack of understanding by the design team and the owners of the companies and the boards who, you know, let's admit are mostly going to be men. And they just don't understand because I had this revelation one time about representation. I think about representation a lot and why it's so important. And I think men don't really understand representation because everywhere they look, they have representation, even sort of unconsciously, you know, like all the billboards are men, all Mm -hmm. the magazine covers are men. And in the same way, you know, like they can't understand dealing with equipment or clothing that is not made for them. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Because also, I would I would like to think that no one person or institution or entity, right, is deliberately doing this <laughs> in a way, right? But I mean, to your point, I feel that, like, take something like breasts. I think for a lot of the Scientists who were studying biomechanics um, and even the even bra designers who were literally designing garments for breasts didn't take it seriously, like didn't understand the actual physical like feeling and potential pain and just social cultural barriers too, right, involved with breasts and wanting to play sports if you're a person with breasts that they just never thought about it in that way, that it could be this tremendous barrier that keeps people from participating and that can literally alter your like running gait in terms of, you know, if you have larger breasts, you're going to pull your arms in a little closer to your chest to try to minimize some of that side to side movement. You you might not take as long strides because again, you want to try to minimize that amount of impact that you're having. So they never studied, they never studied it. Or, you know, I remember talking to one of the researchers, um, this woman, LaJean Lawson, who was trying to study this back in the late 80s. And, you know, someone basically emailed her, told her, she's like, why are you studying that? Like, there's nothing to study. Just go to a track and go watch a woman and go run and you'll just know it goes up and down and up and down, you know, (laughs) just like dismissing it off the bat. I'm like, well, actually, yeah. You know, it's much more complicated. Like breast movement is tremendously complicated. And if anything, we should be studying that, right? To understand how it moves, how we can design better garments to control that movement comfortably. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting into that moment of like, oh my God, this is so (laughs) so (laughs) frustrating. (laughs) Because, you know, the, the other thing about reading your book, I just kept on you know, writing in the margins, like, this is systemic, this is systemic, you know, like, why, you know, like, why and how did we get to a point where man is default? And like, is there any way to extricate ourselves from that? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, obviously something I've been thinking a lot, too, because in, in writing this, I didn't want the book just to be all negative, right? Like in thinking, these are all the ways we've been, you know, harmed and science doesn't like us and sports doesn't like us and poo, 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 right? And thinking about, well, what can we do? And how do we, how do we move forward from here? Because I agree, 
so much of it is systemic. So much of it is just ingrained in our culture, in our thinking, and in our institutions that it is really hard to think about a different path forward without blowing everything up. And I don't I don't necessarily think <laughs> I don't I'm I'm not advocating for blowing everything up. <laughs> um, just be clear. Um, but I think what I do take from all of this is that I do see change, right? I do see the fact that we are talking about this even, the fact that I could even write a book about this and that it's published by a major publisher who is interested in this topic. The fact that there are more researchers now who are interested in this topic and more women, I think it's in large part too, because there are more women coming up through medical and science fields who were athletes when they were younger, who see the importance of this. And, you know, to your point about representation, they get it, right? They want to understand these questions as much as we do. So I see a lot of that and I, and I take heart in, you know, the younger generations too, who are it seems I mean, definitely more than I would have like standing up to say like, wait, this is wrong. And we, I think we deserve a better culture of sports around us. Today's episode is sponsored by Endura Athletic. Endura Athletic is on a mission to create ethically sourced athletic apparel that empowers and supports athletic women's bodies. Rather than asking women to fit into clothes, Endura Athletic Apparel fits clothes to women, making space for powerful lats, broad shoulders, and strong legs. Through artfully designed, sweat-tested, and well-fitting apparel, women can tackle their workouts while feeling confident in their physique, whatever shape it takes. Last week, I did my very first run in a pair of Endura Stay Put shorts, and love them. They definitely stay put. I had none of that typical creeping up of shorts legs and then having to yank them down over and over throughout the run. The waistband is also really nice and not restrictive. You can order your own stay put shorts and find out more at EnduraAthletic.com or on this episode's show notes page. Hey there, my name is Michael Laminato and this is Pit Pass F1 a brand new podcast that'll take you closer to the action of the world's most prestigious motorsport. From Monaco to Miami and Australia to Azerbaijan, Pit Pass F1 is on the ground and has you covered. Esteemed F1 journalists Julianne Serasoli and Chris Medland will take you inside the sport every round. They'll keep you up to date with the latest news breaking in Formula One and the most influential views shaping the world of Grand Prix racing. Every Friday, we'll be bringing you a track guide and race preview, and Chris and Drew will be in your feed every morning from Saturday through to Monday to keep you up to date on all the day's action on and off the track. So if you want to be in the know on the latest in Formula One, subscribe wherever you get your favourite podcasts and visit us at evergreenpodcasts.com. Pit Pass F1, a brand new show for Evergreen Podcasts. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Cherie Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures. And now, let's get back to my conversation with Christine Yu, award-winning journalist and author of Up to Speed, The Groundbreaking Science of Women Athletes. Well, one of the examples that you brought up that I thought was super fascinating was about dance. And Mm -hmm. I think the reason it fascinated me was, like, we have this assumption that women, because of how they're built, etc., will always bugger up their ACLs Mm -hmm. more than men. And yet there's this dance example that you gave in the book. Yeah. So, right, that the research says women are two to eight times more likely to tear their ACL than men. The, you know, traditional line of thinking is that it's because of our wider hips. We have a, you know, it's because of the Q angle. And then, you know, more recently, 
you know, thinking about the menstrual cycle and how hormones fluctuate, that maybe there are certain times during the month when the ligament is more lax and we're more susceptible to these injuries, um, which is fine, right? Like I understand <laughs> that researchers need to try to understand what are some of these potential risk factors so that we could potentially protect against them. But when we only zero in on, you know, what's wrong with someone's body, it's a pretty disheartening narrative because there's really not much I can do about the the width of my pelvis or, you know, when and how my hormones fluctuate. It's not like a proactive thing I can I can act on, right? And so what's interesting is that there was this study done with dancers, so looking at male and female dancers, because in dance, there isn't this huge disparity in ACL tears between boys and girls. And so what researchers did was they took these dancers, they had them stand up on, you know, a platform or a box, and then, you know, standing up on one leg and then drop down to the floor beneath them, right? Just kind of like hop down, land on one leg. And then they watched and saw like, what kind of strategies did they use to stabilize their knees and hips when they landed? Did their knees collapse inward? Were they, you know, engaging X, Y, Z muscle groups? What was the the stress going through the knee? And so when they did that with the dancers, they saw that the both groups, the boys and girls, used similar strategies to land. So there wasn't much difference there in the biomechanics. They also did the same test with team sports players. And so when they looked at boy team sports players and they, you know, hopped off this platform, they used similar strategies as the dancers, right? They were able to stabilize their knee and hips. There wasn't all this awkward movement that would potentially put them at risk for hurting their ACLs. What was interesting was that when they looked at girls who played team sports, they (laughs) used completely different landing strategies. Their knees fell inward. There was a lot more instability at the knee and at the hip. Again, that put them in this more risky position. So it begged the question of, is it just or really anatomy or is it something else? Is it the fact that these dancers, the boys and girls, right, have been largely dancing since they were little and have been taught how to jump, how to land safely, and how to use their bodies. And they've been practicing this for years. And similarly with the boy team sports players, but with the girl team sports players, is it because they haven't been taught that? They haven't been encouraged to use their bodies in that same kind of way. So they haven't been learning these strategies from an early age and they haven't been practicing it as long. Could that be a reason why they don't stabilize themselves as well when they do land? So it just broadens the question, right? In terms of what are the actual forces and factors at play here outside of just a person's body? Right. And you also mentioned in the book about how younger girls don't get the same strength training. Yeah. Because, options. yeah, because we often say strength is like a protective factor against injury. And again, with boys and men, they tend to have more lean muscle mass than girls. And so, Maybe that's one reason why, you know, their bodies appear to be more resilient. But maybe it's also because girls aren't encouraged to go lift weights, that the weight room has always been kind of this masculine domain. I think it's changing a little bit, but um, especially for for uh, kids in adolescence and whether or not like high school coaches are encouraging their girl athletes to get into the weight room and to train, there's a lot of... I think social and cultural factors there that that make it harder for girls to build strength. So it's may not just be the fact that they have less muscle mass or you know even less potential, right, to build muscle mass, but maybe there are these other factors that keep them from even trying. I really am fascinated by sort of systematic reasons for, you know, whatever. And another example that you brought up in the book was how at women's soccer games, even at a high level, the doctors that were required to be on site, there were many fewer of them at women's games than men's. And this totally blew my mind because even at a higher level, like 
oh my gosh, how can this be allowed? I mean, and especially since this is one of the examples of something that could be changed tomorrow. Yeah. You just change the requirements. I, it's easy. Yeah. I can't remember what year that study or that article came out. So I'm really hoping <laughs> that things have changed since then. But yeah, but there was this huge disparity between the number of doctors on the field at men's professional games versus at women's professional games. And that makes a difference. Like, and especially for something like concussion, where studies have actually shown that, um, so, you know, on the whole, when you look at some of the studies, it will, it will say that either women are more prone to concussions or women's outcomes are worse than men, meaning that they take longer to recover and return to sport. But it may also actually have to do with the fact of when those people get to a doctor or get access to care. So when boys and girls who are concussed actually saw a doctor within the same time frame, those disparities disappeared. So if there was an actual physiological reason for why women had worse outcomes, it shouldn't hold up, right? Like that shouldn't disappear just because they saw a doctor sooner, right? Or like within a certain time frame, that should hold up. Well, this means that, you know, it really does matter when someone accesses care. And we see in other studies at the NCAA level that, you know, those disparities in resources and athletic department priorities may potentially affect concussion outcomes. So when they looked at, again, NCAA level, they segmented the data by contact sports, right? So full contact, um, minimal contact, and no contact. When they looked at the full contact sports, again, women had worse outcomes than men. And so that could potentially be because of, again, the athletic department priorities. Because what are the full contact sports? It's like football. And, right? and like... Football is very important in collegiate athletics. So they are more likely to invest, make sure that there are resources on the field, right, to make sure that those players are taken care of. Or it might also be because those football teams have larger rosters. So they have more athletic trainers on the field as well. When researchers looked at the minimal contact sports, what was interesting was that actually the men's gymnasts had worse outcomes. And again, it could be athletic priorities because men's gymnastics typically is not as prioritized. So maybe they're not getting as much resources. So it can go both ways, right? It's not just about affecting, you know, girls and women, it could potentially be affecting these men as well. So yeah, it just brings up this question of like, what, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, it, you had some heartbreaking stories, particularly of Brianna Scurry, who was the soccer player who just suffered for so long. And it's very possible that it was because she did not get the care that she needed right away. Yeah. And so, I mean, it was kind of a dream to be able to talk to Brianna because I remember watching the 99ers win the World Cup and that being such a pivotal moment, it felt like, for women's sports. But yeah, she said... She got a concussion on the field. She knew something was wrong. She left at halftime, but she didn't know that that was, that was her last game, professional game ever, right? Um, they all kind of just expected her to get better because that's what's happened in the past. Like she would rest and kind of like in her brain would reset as she described it to me. But this time her brain didn't do that. They didn't know what was going on. And, you know, she kept seeing doctors. And I think some of this gets tied up in kind of health insurance things she told me or, and whatnot in terms of like the kind of doctors, you know, the league was having her see or potentially see. But from what she said was that a lot of these doctors literally didn't even lay a hand on her to understand where her pain was coming from while they were examining her, which is mind boggling to me. But when we talked, she would kept saying like that it was unfathomable, right? Like she, if anyone should have been able to get access to good care. She's at the top of her game, an Olympian, a World Cup champion, you know, has theoretically, right, the resources of the Olympic and Paralympic Committee of the Soccer Federation behind her. And yet they didn't know <laughs> what was going on. Um, and they didn't know how to help her. 
And she's and she said herself, like she had no idea that these concussion symptoms and outcomes and all of it was so prevalent in women's soccer. Like it was so at that point, right? No one was really paying attention to it. So she ended up, it was like three years before she finally found a doctor who was able to help her. But it was like heartbreaking, like you said, because she was so depressed. She had experienced like suicidal ideation. Uh, She could barely get out of bed and couldn't function. And, you know, they kept trying to (laughs) tell her, oh, you know, you're fine. You're fine. She's like, I'm not fine. Like, I'm an elite athlete. Like, this is not my fine. This might be fine for like a 65-year-old man, but this is not fine for me. Um, So being that struggle to be able to get to get care and to be able to recover was so long and drawn out. That story brings up two thoughts that kept on coming up in my you know, notes in the sidelines is one just feel like the onus being placed on, yeah. on Brianna in particular. And that happens a lot. It's like we're having to figure things out. And it's because we're we, we in the big we, we're not providing women athletes with the proper tools, you know, for success, whether that's the clothing or the medical health or the information, training as youth, knowledge, guidance, any of that. No. And, you know, And I do think it all comes back to the fact that we haven't been paying attention to this at all, right? right? I think it's, um, you know, if you think about also at the other end of the spectrum, so for folks kind of going through the menopause transition or, you know, who are post-menopause, the fact that, you know, for most of our adult lives, for our doctors, we're seeing like, you know, OBGYNs. And, but (laughs) their primary, you know, specialty is, you know, those childbearing years. So once we're out of those years, who's supposed to be taking care of us? And the fact that like menopause and what that means and the health related symptoms, and even just like specializing in that, it's so under taught in medical schools and in residencies that it leaves this huge gap in the market for older women who are looking for care. Uh, I'm like have this gigantic pause because that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, I totally identified with something that uh, one of the people that you spoke to said, you know, like nobody ever told me about this. And yeah. that's exactly how I felt. Yeah, nobody talks about it. And again, I don't know if it's just because it's not a polite conversation. <laughs> um, you know, it's not nice to talk about things like our bodies or or what it is, but because we don't do that, we really are stacking the cards against girls and women in the long run. And, you know, and not just in terms of sports performance, but just health and well-being. Just before we got on, I was talking to this other professor out at Cal State Long Beach who has been studying a lot of bone stress injuries and runners and been leading these nutritional interventions. And she studies a lot of high school age athletes and looking at, you know, bone density and all of that. And it's, you know, it's very prevalent. Like the low bone density is so prevalent in this population. When you think about the high school athlete population, they're not all going on to run in college. So they're not all elites, right? So it's a mix of kids at this level. And yet there is still, I can't, I don't want to misquote, I can't remember the, the exact percentage, but it was I want to say it was like around 40% of those runners have low bone density. And so we were talking about this and and whatnot. But at one point, I'm like, why don't we just tell (laughs) kids about this, right? Like, why don't we tell kids and parents that, look, adolescence is this tremendous period of growth. Your body's, yes, your body is changing and you're going through puberty. You know, you're becoming like mature or whatever. But that also means that your skeleton is growing. This is a critical period of time for you to build bone and bone mass. And if you don't do that now, that has, (laughs) you can't gain it back as you get older, right? Like that has long-term implications. And I feel like I would have liked that information (laughs) as a young girl, like growing up and just to understand like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Oh, wait, so, I shouldn't be just surviving on like whatever ridiculous lunch, you know, non-lunch I was having, (laughs) right? Because like my body actually needs this fuel 
to not only support its growth and yes, like I need my menstrual cycle because blah, blah, blah. I need all those hormones to support all of this growth. It's not just, a, you know, it is a pain in the neck, but like it's important. But I feel like if we just are able to arm girls and women with information that we can just set ourselves up better down the road. Science is so slow. Yeah. You know, and you mentioned this in the book, how it takes 17 years between the publishing of a study and when actually that information gets out into the world and is is used. And I think, you know, about REDS, you know, about fueling yourself. And I just am surprised at, you know, I'm in this. You know, I think about this all the time. I do the podcast. I talk about REDS and fueling with a lot of the guests. But I'm surprised that more coaches, like how is it that coaches, all coaches don't know about this? Yeah. And I think it's, you know, probably in part because they don't have to. Right. Right. Like there's like the coaching certification and, you know, curriculum if it exists, it's probably, <laughs> you know, is the quality is so very so much and the content varies, but there's nothing required around this, right? Like, it's it's not um, a requirement of the job. And then especially when you think about at the younger level, too. So like youth sports, it's a lot of parents that are coaching, mm-hmm. um, who are, you know, kind of doing it for fun, whether they're doing it for fun or not, or what, <laughs> or whatever, but like, but you know, they don't have to be certified in anything or know about this. But I think that that's one piece with the reds and the underfueling that has, yeah, it's kind of baffling to me because researchers were looking into this in like the late 80s, early 90s. Like they knew the repercussions of it. They saw it, right, in, in athletes dying from eating disorders. And they were committed to doing something about this and trying to raise the alarm. And yet, like you said, it's still not common knowledge. And I and I, I and I think a lot about why that might be. And you know, part of me thinks that it goes back to this idea that because it's so tied up in, you know, eating disorders or disordered eating and diet culture, that it becomes this assumption that it's, you know, oh, they're just obsessed about how they look, right? That again, it becomes this like body image issue that is seen as primarily a thing or problem for girls and women. And it's a vanity thing. And that, you know, we can brush it aside because it's not serious. Despite the fact that eating disorders have such a high mortality rate. And it, I, I, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about like, why don't we talk more about eating disorders? Why are they still so underrepresented? Because they affect a huge swath of the population, whether or not you have a quote unquote clinically, you know, diagnosed eating disorder or not, pretty sure most, you know, vast majority of us have some sort of disordered eating tendency, right? Or some body image issue. But I wonder if it's because it's often assumed as this like vanity thing or like, you know, aesthetic thing that again, it gets brushed off because, you know, it's it's a girl or a woman's concern. I wondered if it was just part of this thing that I still haven't figured out exactly how to like how to encapsulate it. But this this dismissive aspect, which is sort mm. of what you were getting at, is like we're seeing it as an isolated aspect of of this sport, which is game. Like it's mm-hmm, fun. Mm-hmm. It's game. We're not taking into account, you know, the long term implications of of health, not just sport and physical activity, but long term health. And, and that goes into a lot of the stuff that you talked about in the book is that this is not just about sport. It's about being a healthy human being. Yeah, because, you know, f- for me, like this book definitely isn't just about, right, the pro athlete or the elite athletes and or the people who, you know, are performance driven and have these like high goals or whatnot. Sure, that is part of the story. But for me, like a bigger piece of this and a bigger piece of what motivated me to write this is that there's so, there's so many benefits, right, to physical activity and just moving your body 
And I know for myself that that's such an integral piece of who I am and that ability to just enjoy whatever form of movement I'm into at the moment and how that can ground me, right? And it's not even that I have no... (laughs) I have no athletic goals currently at the you know in anywhere in the near future. I'm currently injured trying to figure this out, but even if I wasn't injured, like it's it's not about that. And so for me it is like how can we learn more? How can we support more people to get involved and stay involved in whatever way shape or form they want, right? Um, How can we break down some of those barriers and how can we really just understand humans as a whole better so that we can potentially, yes, improve our health, improve our well-being, you know, whatever, you know, markers that means for you. But yeah, but it is about kind of widening this gate, if you will. I thought a lot about what have we lost over the years by not including more people in these studies. Mm, yeah, it's um, it's really interesting because I also had a recent conversation with uh, Virginia Soulsmith. So she just wrote a book called Fat Talk, Parenting in the Age of Diet Culture, I think. I'm just double checking. Yeah, which is a fantastic book. And I literally tabbed up pretty much every page. But we talked a lot about youth sports and, you know, when there is this idea that there's a certain standard, body, person, whatever you want to say, right, that's idealized, that is the athlete in a certain sport, you cut out so many different people. So, you know, for example... I mean, she was saying, like, we have this narrative in our head that, like, fat kids are lazy, fat kids are unathletic. But if there's no jersey that in your size, if there's no dance uniform in your size, what are you going to do? If you are on a team, but your coach keeps you on the bench the whole time, and he's not, he or she is not paying attention to you because all of their focus is on on the kids that they think are good athletes and are going to help you win, you're not gaining anything from that, right? And she was also telling me, you know, she talked to tons of people who played soccer, played or danced or, you know, did whatever sport and loved it, but then got to a certain age, like 11, 12, 13, when they realized that their body wasn't the right body for the sport, considered the right body. And then they left, right? They just dropped it out of their lives, despite the fact that they had loved it so much. And so, yes, we we cut out this whole swath of people that don't fit the frame of who we consider athletic, which, again, is kind of a self, you know, self-perpetuating <laughs> ideal, because if if then we don't let people in different size bodies participate, then we don't actually know, right, like what they can do or not or whatever. But then even when we look at the studies that are based on men, that's also a pretty narrow swath of men that they're looking at. For the most part, it is like younger college age boys, mostly from westernized countries. But there's a lot of other people outside of that, too, who are in male bodies. So, yeah, I feel like, you know, we end up defining these things about sports and performance and what it means to be an athlete based on a really small picture of the human population. Yeah, I mean, I thought about a lot when when I was reading your book, like this, I mean, I wrote down dichotomy, and I don't know if that's the right word, but this dichotomy between, you know, competition, winning, and just health, Mm. long-term health. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a former pro athlete. I, I love competition. I love that aspect of it. I love watching sports like that. But for me, like the, the, like the, really intrinsic stuff that's important to me is long-term health. Yeah. And I wonder if because we've become so focused on that competitive part of it, and especially the elite part of it, and the way that that trickles down into youth sports, you know, through college, all of that, if that, you know, makes this whole 
world so much more charged, right? Like it becomes so much more intense because like you got to be the best. You got to make it to the next level. You're going to be the Olympian or whatever it is, right? But do (laughs) six-year-olds need to play clips, you know, on a travel team and, you know, and play like in these like intensive tournaments? I mean, I'd argue no, (laughs) but like, I wonder if like, if, I don't know, because I'm, I'm with you. Like I love watching sports. I love watching people compete in their top form and all of that. But I also very much value that other end of the spectrum too. And I don't know, you know, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive, but I feel like right now we're in this environment where we over focus on that elite side of things as if that's the only way to go. And we cut so many people out because we only focus on that. And I think there's something else about that for me is that it's not just we're cutting them out, but we're somehow convincing them that there's something wrong with them. You yes. know, like I've been thinking about women who are just out of college, new job, maybe new family, and that group of women have a real hard time making time or finding time to stay physically active, even if they participated in sports in college or high school or whatever. And this is a real shame. Again, I'm going to, you know, like I'm repeating myself, but we're not just talking about sports. We're talking about their physical well-being, their mental well-being, blah, 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 I can go on, their career. And, you know, this is terrible. And we make them feel like something's wrong with them, that they, you know, like they can't figure out how to do it. Meanwhile, we're not giving them the tools to be able to do that. Yeah, any of the support, right? You're just, you're just asked to figure it out, (laughs) you know, like, it's not that hard, figure it out. But it but it is hard. It is hard when you don't have any guidance or research or community or support, or anyone right to really turn to, because you're expected to just figure it out. And yeah, and this whole idea that there's something wrong with your body, I feel like is so prevalent. And Yeah, I mean, that kind of was one of the first things that I started thinking about when writing this book. I'm like, do we feel like that because we don't have the research, right? Because it doesn't reflect our lived experience or our bodies. um, So we feel like there's something wrong. I don't know, but that that piece of feeling like there's something wrong with your body breaks my heart. And I think it's, that's the piece that, I don't know, I hope that the book kind of validates some of the experience or at least reflects some of their experience to know that it's not just them and that it there isn't anything wrong with their bodies per se um, but maybe there's something wrong with the system and the environment in which we're trying to live and operate in that makes it impossible for us and our bodies yeah i mean i Definitely found the book frustrating to read. However, I also (laughs) found a lot of hope in just like, you know, let's look at the data. Let's see those dance examples. Let's see that it is systematic. It's not me. It's not my body. You know, I mean, I think that that is very hopeful. So let's go back a little bit to being optimistic. What changes are you seeing? Are you expecting? Do you want to see? Like, are you hopeful? I am. And I think... You know, so on the actual research side of things, I am very hopeful because, like I said, there is so much more interest in this, not only from the scientists and the researchers themselves, but from the general public. People want to know, and there's this real hunger for information, and I am hopeful that that will continue to drive more studies and more investment in this area. There's also you know, efforts to standardize a lot of this, or at least come up with standardized protocols and methodologies in a way, because, you know, the the argument for why women aren't included is largely you know, because of our menstrual cycles. And that, you know, takes time. And, you know, there are different ways you can account for the menstrual cycle. But if you standardize some of that, or at least tell people This is how I've done it in the past. It provides, again, a roadmap for newer scientists who are coming into this, and then they might feel less intimidated to actually take on some of these studies. And if you have common protocols, common definitions, then you can compare studies across each other, right? And you can draw larger conclusions, which 
you know, maybe that starts to shrink that 17-year translation gap, right? Because part of the problem, I would guess, is because there are a lot of studies of varying quality, varying methodologies that makes it impossible for you to then come up with a solid evidence base, right? Um, So on that side, I'm, you know, definitely hopeful. You know, it is a question of whether or not people will invest in it, whether or not Uh, funders will invest in this type of research because it's not cheap. It's not easy, but you need the agencies and the funders to step up to also say, I'm not just saying I care about women's sports. Look, I I actually care about women's sports. I want to make this better. And I think, as I was saying before, you know, then looking at the younger generation coming up, I mean, they're phenomenal in so many different ways. Uh, like I I can't imagine, you know, I look back on my teen years and college years, I'm like, I don't do anything. I just try to survive. But these women on like collegiate teams are stepping up and saying, we're not standing for this. We deserve a better culture of sport. We deserve better coaching. We deserve better treatment. And I think that, you know, there is this recognition on that level that they can do, they, there is an option for something different, that they can push for that. And I think having that, you know, even just being able to see that as a potential pathway is huge, right? That they don't feel like it's, they're just stuck with the status quo and it is just what it is. Um, and there's nothing that they can do about it. So in, in that, I'm, I am very hopeful because I think that some of these younger women and athletes that are coming up are just powerhouses, <laughs> frankly. I mean, they're so inspiring, you know, and just some of the, you know, ones that I've spoken to for various articles, like just truly inspire me with their courage and, you know, their conviction um, and their commitment to this. So, yeah, Absolutely. I mean, like, yeah, I, I, I am <laughs> I am hopeful. I'm also realistic too. I know that like, like we said, a lot of this is systemic and it's not something that will just change on a dime and it, it, it's going to be hard, right. And uncomfortable because we are challenging a lot of notions that are so ingrained in our society that we've all just taken as fact. But I, I do think that it is necessary to kind of step back and evaluate okay, what what really is going on here? What can we, if we say we really care about girls and women, if we say that we really care about girls and women in sport, what does that actually mean? And how can we actually, you know, move towards that goal in a meaningful way? Right. And you said that, you know, you don't want to blow things up, but at the same time, you know, like sometimes it does take that. It will take that. And, 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 you know, there's ramifications to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's not definitely not an easy answer. No, it's not an easy answer. I want to wrap up by asking you a question that in the book you said you asked other people, which is, what is your relationship to sports and why is it important to you? Um, right now, I have a very, very fraught, <laughs> fraught relationship with sports. Yes, you're injured. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. I, I, well, speaking of knee injuries, I tore my ACL in February skiing. So this oh. is actually my third ACL tear, but it's on my good knee. So, so now they're like even. So yes, currently very fraught um, and frustrated. But, you know, as someone who grew up, you know, I'm Chinese American. My parents were not super active. My brother and sister were, and I've honestly have no idea how we all got into sports, but we all played some sports. It was never something that was, my parents were like, like, this is what you should do, right? It wasn't something to be, to aspire to per se, but it really has become, like I said, just an integral part of me. It's when I feel most like myself and most grounded. And it's also when I feel powerful, frankly, you know, despite the fact that I feel like I'm lifting lighter and lighter weights when I should be lifting heavier or whatever it is. But, but it is like, it's, it's, um, it's a piece of my life that gives me joy on the whole, right? So it's not like I enjoy every single moment of whatever I'm doing, but it is the way that I seek joy. 
It's interesting that that's true, given all the injuries that you've had. Yeah, it's a very complicated <laughs> relationship. I mean, because like, I mean, to be honest, right, it's like I have sworn at my body for so long, right, and, and just like been so mad at it because I, you know, I keep thinking that I'm so injury prone, right? That's become a persona for me that like, oh, I'm just injury prone. I'm not made to do this. But I think through the process of researching and reporting and writing this book, like I've actually been able to give myself a little bit more grace that it's not actually my fault per se, um, that some things just are, right? You know, with this last injury, like it wasn't a dramatic fall or anything like that. You know, there's a ton of powder in Tahoe and it was like, I got a little excited probably. <laughs> and, you know, I came off a turn and, you know, caught like a tiny bit of air and just landed really hard straight down on my skis. And that was enough to apparently pop my ACL. But it was nothing that I did wrong, right? Like that was that was a freak accident. That's going to happen. We all assume some sort of risk whenever we play any sort of sport or do anything active. That's always a risk that's out there. So yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. But, like, <laughs> but in the sense that like, I feel like I've, I've kind of grown a little bit in that way to, you know, be a little bit kinder to myself and my body um, as a result of this book. Well, may, may we all get the same <laughs> from, from reading your book. Your book is excellent. I didn't say that. It just was, other than frustrating, it was incredibly well written and a, a real joy to read, actually. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This was a super fun conversation. Yeah, for me too. What a pleasure to talk to Christine about her new book, Up to Speed. I hope you learned something today. Listening to my conversation with her, keep spreading awareness about female athletes, staying active and healthy, and continue to build your community with like-minded folks. I'd love to hear from you. Email me at elizabeth at hearhersports.com or connect through socials at hearhersports. There's also a contact page on the website. For more about Christine, links to things mentioned in the episode, including a link to the specialized saddle designed from the ground up for women, head to the show notes page. There's also a link to our bookshop page where you can get your copy of Up to Speed. Hear Her Sports is a proud member of Evergreen Podcasts. For more information or to check out other shows on the network, please visit evergreenpodcast.com. And until next time, bye-bye. Have you ever wanted to know how to win a Formula One Grand Prix? I mean, really know. Know about the driver tactics from the cockpit, the strategy calls from the pit wall, and even the mind games in the paddock. There's a lot more that goes into winning a Grand Prix than just 90 minutes of racing. So every week on the F1 Strategy Report, we're taking a deep dive into the decisions that shape every result. Hey there, my name is Michael Laminato, and every week I'm joined by an expert guest from the paddock to talk through the big calls that won the race and the missteps that resulted in bitter defeat. Before every race, we'll look back at the previous year's result and consult the current form guide, and we'll be in your feed after every Grand Prix, dissecting the outcome and what it means for the championship. So for your regular hit of Formula One analysis, subscribe to the F1 Strategy Report wherever you get your favourite podcasts. The Strategy Report is a beer mogul podcast on the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name's Michael Laminato and I'll catch you after the chequered flag.